this first bit of the presentation should take about half an hour of me talking you through, you through the um the updated residential design guidance so the places to live document as you will all be familiar with um sorry i think that can somebody just confirm can you still see my powerpoint yeah we can see it steve OK, I can't see it. Ah, oh, there goes. Come back. Um, OK, yes. So, yeah, Places to Live 2014 document, really successful. Um, and you've all been working to that with your projects um, for many years. And it just needs a bit of a refresh and some you know, few specific elements updated, which we'll specifically focus you on. Key thing to mention is that it's really great to have your feedback today. And as well as you asking us questions, we may ask you questions or your views on things. But please do bear in mind this isn't part of the formal commenting process. So this helps you find out a bit more. It might help you shape your comments or focus your comments onto certain parts. But if you do want to make have your voice heard and your views taken into account, you do need to write in formally as part of the SPG consultation process. And as you know, those 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 responses get collated and reported back to planning committee. Um, the other thing to say, as well as talking to you today, as a collectively let's call you the development industry the you know the the, the organizations and the individuals involved in delivering and creating and managing places in swansea we are also running a separate um sort of non-technical engagement with children young people um you know just everyone who may live and be a resident and grow up um, and spend their lives in these developments as well so we've got to be mindful of there's the industry and there's the people that will live there and be at both sides of that coin are important and final thing to say before i click the first slide is that in this presentation you will see various images of positive schemes that embrace those place making principles um, and we have permission to use those images as, as some of you will know because we've been in contact with your, your organizations or your designers and they are featured in the main residential design guidance document if you feel that there's a project that we haven't featured maybe that that should be in the document please do get in touch okay so before we really get into the Swansea guidance, I think it's important just to remind all of us, and this should be totally familiar now, about the importance of placemaking nationally within um, within Wales. So what I've got here on uh, on the screen are a series of bullet points, which are largely extracted from the quote on page, I think 16 it is, of Planning Policy Wales. Picking out those key things, reminding us all placemaking is a holistic approach. Planning's become too system and target orientated, in my view personally. And placemaking is a good resetting and refocusing. That's what planners do. We don't exist to move paper around, we exist to create and shape and manage and create fantastic places. So it's about positivity, it's about outcomes. So I can't do the lobby. So if somebody could let in whoever's just beeped. Um, yeah, and it's about quality and yeah, public spaces and really important there, sort of middle of the page. The planning system is about making people happy. That is fantastic. You know, prosperity, health, happiness and well-being in the widest sense. That is the reason we do what we do. And that is the underpinning to a lot of our design guidance. And it isn't just a big strategic development. It isn't the city centre stuff. It isn't the large scale strategic sites. It's all scales right down to a small infill backland development, right down even because the session this afternoon is about householder extensions. So and it's all about joining up thinking. It's all about being um, collaborative. And I think it's fair to say that good or great places really result from a sort of an, an attritional um, a difficult negotiation process. Great places result from that fantastic collaboration, that spark where everyone's on the same page, seeking to live, deliver the same thing and understands everyone's points of views. But it's all about working together and allowing sufficient time. And we all know, obviously, that placemaking is the key mechanism for delivering the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. The graphic at the bottom of the page that is very familiar to all of us. Um, with the set seven goals, which I, I won't read out, but just to say all seven goals are relevant to the residential developments we create, you know, prosperity, resilience, health, equality, cohesiveness, culture and language and globally responsible. Everything's relevant. And the way of doing that isn't just placemaking, it's these five ways of working. And the two I'm going to specifically just mention is obviously prevention. If we get these places right, obviously we will make sure we're embracing well-being and health that's got longer term benefits for for our healthcare system for society in general so that's looking for the future for prevention you could also look at flood prevention about future prevention and mitigation there and also collaboration this all happens through collaboration it's not about the lpa setting out a series of you know definite rules and it's not about developers battling 
to get everything um, in a certain way. It's about us coming to get together to create these great places. So it's important to be aware that I think it was autumn last year, the placemaking charter for Wales was launched, um, which was um, largely led by the Design Commission for Wales, and has been signed up to by a huge range of um, actors um, um, in the in the sort of the built environment across Wales, including RSL, housing associations, uh, many developers, highway institutions as well, which is really relevant because placemaking isn't just the planning function. Placemaking is whole organisation wide, so it's the whole of Swansea Council, it's the whole of your organisation. And I'm really, really proud and pleased to say, as you may know, that Swansea Council was one of the first local authorities to sign up to the placemaking charter early this, earlier this year. So as an organisation, if you look on the placemaking charter um, list on the website for on the Design Commission, you'll find Swansea Council. And the key thing about the charter, there's six pledges there on the screen there on the right hand side, which pretty much bring placemaking down to that simple page. It's about involving the community, it's choosing sustainable locations, it's prioritising active travel, it's creating great streets, it's a sustainable mix of uses, um, and it's distinctiveness and they're really good headings and maybe you've already started doing this if you're if you're an agent or a designer but these are really good headings to sort of structure your design and access statement and structure your thinking about the places you're creating because these are kind of you know, been clearly highlighted as, as, the, as the, the matrix to look at them through. So as Tom mentioned before we need to update our current 2014 residential design guide. Um, you know, it is still in use and it is still very good and definitely fit for purpose. And it just needs a few kind of refinements. And that's why we're talking to you, to you today. You will know that we use that document day in, day out. It's used across many hundreds of schemes since 2014, since it was adopted. And when you think it applies to projects of tens up to hundreds of houses, many thousands of homes have been through that process of the current places to live SPG. We just had 720 houses approved the week before for the Garden Village project. So it's in, you know very actively used. And we know it's well, re well received by all of you out there, developers, architects, designers and agents. You know your way through the document, you know the expectations and you know the bits we're going to sort of be using to structure discussions. And um, we also know that when things may be do need to be refused, um, and obviously that may happen in some instances, that the planning inspectors give these SPGs good weight you know, in dismissing appeals. So you know, you, you'll, you'll see the appeal decisions and you'll see the SPGs being cited in many, many of those. But it does need to be updated for the um, abbreviated Wellbeing Future Generations Act there on the screen. There's a great emphasis since 2014 on active travel. Green infrastructure is a definite thing that's brought together the sort of the thinking around landscape and activity and ecology into one central multifunctional um, way of thinking. So that's come through since 2014. And clearly SUDS sustainable drainage is a very recent thing which we know is presenting challenges, but also some really great opportunities for greening of streets. Um, and feeding into the review, there's also been um, you know, the, a review of recent developments in the background there. That's a CGI, but that's you. Know, many of you'll know that's the um, Pennard Drive development by um, Coastal Housing out in Gower. So that's pretty much the largest affordable housing site in the Gower area of outstanding natural beauty, which the, um, the Places to Live Residential Design Guide has been constructive in helping to shape, as well as the parallel design guide for the Gower area specifically. So that's the front cover of the document, if you're not already aware of the amended document, I should say. So one thing that you might notice, especially if, you, if you've got sort of um, go to paragraphs is it's been reformatted from portrait to landscape, which means things have moved around and paragraph numbers may have changed. So, you know, you, it will take some time to kind of get familiar to which bits have changed, which bits have moved, but some bits have significantly changed and we will signpost those today but we won't necessarily have enough time to go into, we're not going to be picking through you know, in detail by paragraph by paragraph because it's 104 pages, the document, and you really need to go and read it following this presentation and focus your comments if you wish to flag things up. So that's what it currently looks at. We're talking about the other two, the householder and the infill in the, in the subsequent sessions, but that's the document we're talking about today. That's the front cover and that's the one that's probably on your, on your virtual bookshelf, um, hopefully. Um, well read. Um, and before we get into the actual guidance structure of the document, it's just really important to emphasise placemaking does take time and resources. But ultimately, these places, the places that we live with, live in now, you know, the Victorian legacy, 
these places are going to be around for 100 years plus. So we need to be mindful of the time taken to create the places in terms of the planning process, but before that, the design process. So we've got their building in time for design. You know, it's not just crank a handle and outcomes another place, outcomes another development. It needs that negotiation. It needs that understanding. The importance of pre-application um, in terms of the um, local authority engagement, the, the, the planning performance agreements, perhaps the PPAs that could fund that, and then the more formal Welsh Government pre-application community consultation process that you, obviously you all know you need to do now in terms of engaging with external stakeholders and communities. Fundamental to that placemaking process are design and access statements, and it, it breaks my heart when we see what our tick box design and access statements. We know that the schemes have been designed and a bit of, you know, a few pages have been put together afterwards. They are live documents. They are really important ways of, of collating your thinking, analysing the place that you're intervening in and structuring your kind of explanations of what it's like. And it's really helpful to cross refer if you don't already know about the Design Commission for Wales have worked with Welsh Government to provide a design and access statement guidance. And we're not going to reproduce that in our residential design guide. We're just signposting it. And one of the key questions for the Design Commission is, is why are you flagging that in your DAS? Why have you picked on, up on something? It's no point just telling loads of stuff and then no link to what's proposed. It's, why is it, why have you picked up on it and how does it influence the scheme and just keep you know, just just remembering those questions and you'll get a much better das out of the project um on the next slide i'll come on to outline structures and master plans and that so i'll jump over that one precedence and inspiration are really important there's loads of images now on the internet of great places you don't have to physically go and visit and take pictures as we would have had to do with you know, Poundbury in the early days and I think it's just making sure you use those precedents and inspirations to show what you're seeking to achieve um, what kind of place and you know talking to them maybe the community you're seeking to house um, and to use those visuals um, and we've got to mention obviously the fantastic service the Design Commission for Wales provide in terms of their design review service I am a design review panelist and I can certainly vouch it is a really really valuable process and Many of you on the call today would have had your projects go through that process and it definitely does add value. It does flag some interesting questions, but there's sometimes there are questions that do need to be asked. So generally, all of our strategic sites go through Design Commission for Wales, both at the outline strategic stage and at the Reserve Matters more detailed stages, as well as the H5 and H6 um, sites for um, affordable housing, the um, so, so, so sites that need to be really great in those senses. Um, and some of the other kind of larger scale projects as well. So we will definitely flag up when we feel it should go to Design Commission for Wales, but it's very much for you as the developers and agents to arrange those um, bookings. So briefly talking about the outline process, it's really important to constructively use the outline process to shape places. So this is um, some extracts from the Park, Park Mauer strategic site up in Pentlegair in the north of Swansea. Um, and typically outline applications require parameters, parameters of footprints of buildings, parameters to eaves heights, parameters to ridge heights. But the parameters can be used far more constructively and far more strategically to structure the place. Um, and the, so the parameter plan on the left is a movement plan. So that's key streets, walking routes, access to countryside. We know that uh, uh, ability to access green space loops and links has been fundamentally important during the covid lockdown focuses focusing us onto our local neighborhoods our local green space and that diagram plan there kind of gives us the backbone to the new place it doesn't go down to the minute detail and it does allow flexibility but that gives us a structure the plan on the right hand side there is a land use plan so we know where the higher densities may be the two and a half story the three story townhouses in the north of the site for example where the mixed use local centre is going to be and the school is going to be. So those diagrams are really important. And if any of you are developing schemes of 100 plus homes, um, you also need to be aware of LDP policy um, SD2 that requires a master plan led approach to the sites. So whilst this is a scheme for seven, 800 plus homes, um, it the, the master plan approach does go down to our schemes of 100 or more homes because we know that strategic planning at the earlier stages is the fundamental foundation stone for creating good places. So going back to the guidance, this, as you will know, is the kind of the broad structure of the current 2014 document. Um, there's 12 sections working in sort of from the more strategic overarching aspects such as neighbourhoods, density, mixed uses, the bigger picture aspects, right down to the aspects of detail, such as where the cars are parked and what are the houses look like. The 
eagle-eyed amongst you may notice that whilst there are 12 topics as there were in the in the 2014 guide, some of them have changed names and some of them have moved up and down the list um, just because, you know, for example, there was a section called Natural Heritage, I think it was, which is section C, which is now blue green infrastructure. So the same well, same focus, a bit more on SUDS, um, and it's in a similar position on the hierarchy there. But down towards the bottom there, you may remember that quality and character, how it looks, was the last one. And actually, that's come up the list to be next to townscape um, and parking has gone to the bottom simply because, you know, parking should not dominate, but it's something we've got to think about. So we've done a little bit of rejigging of the structure, but fundamentally similar topics. And I'm just going to run through slides now for each of those 12 topics, giving you a flavour of what's in the section and where some of the changes are. So in terms of that first strategic topic on neighbourhoods, as we all know, in terms of Wellbeing Future Generations Act and, and the, wi the sort of widest um, conception of placemaking, it's about creating and linking into existing um, communities and cohesiveness comes up. That's the big picture kind of thing that we're doing. Walkable neighbourhoods or the you know the 15 minute city or the 15 minute town is a fundamental thing. What can you get to by foot? Um, and that might be through links through the site. It might be new facilities on site, but looking very much you know what's in that immediate zone. Big questions on some of the larger sites. If there are facilities, is where is the centre of that new place? Where are you putting a school? Where are you putting a mixed use development? Where are you putting a park, for example? So how does it relate? How do you get to it? And there's a lot of discussion about almost like pinning that centre and does it make sense? And uh, yeah, and what facilities are deficient in the area and what facilities are provided and how are they integrated? And you know, these are the sort of from some of the largest scale sites. So a few images now. This is a recently consented scheme. Um, a housing association scheme um, for the old Town Hill campus overlooking the city centre, which is a mixed, a new mixed use neighbourhood, including a new commercial unit just at the top of the screen there. Different kind of accommodations, some shared green space and retained kind of existing skyline iconic buildings over here with flats in. So that very much exemplifies that concept of a new neighbourhood that's connected to an existing neighbourhood and definitely kind of raises the quality and character in the area. It also has accessible green green space for the wider neighbourhood and routes through the site. Another example here, which is another image of the Park Mauer strategic site of the new northern local centre within the development there, a new school in the top there, um, new commercial units on the ground floor with residential above, extensive green space in this kind of focal point, like a village green or a town green, if you want to call it that, retained, retained landscape and a new spine street lined by trees coming down through the development. And it certainly is not a bypass. It's definitely manual for streets territory, which is first and foremost a place where the vehicles are accommodated, but not dominant. So that very much exemplifies the first section of the design guide there. Moving on, the second section B, um, density and mixed uses. No fundamental change in this section here. Um, you, you know it's about making the best use of land relative to those appropriate locations. There is the 35 dwelling per hectare target, which is also in our local development plan. And we know that is achievable with a mix of homes. You're not going to achieve that with all three bed detached or three bed semi detached. But once you've got some flats in the mix and some smaller units, we know it's possible and we know it can create great places. And the importance of in integrating affordable housing, both in terms of an appropriate percentage, but in terms of integrating and in design. So it's, it's, it's equitable in terms of architecture and treatment. So here's an, here's another example. Each each slide each each topic generally has a picture sort of after it. So this is the Gwyn Vine scheme, which many of you will know, which is a joint venture between two of our housing associations, and we know this is 35 dwellings per hectare. So we know a great place can be achieved um, at that target density. You can see a mix of accommodations. Some are some are linked detached, some are semi detached. There's some short terraces in parts of the site. There's also flats in the centre. There's good distribution of green space. It's considered to be a green infrastructure exemplar. So that's the kind of density targets and that's what that's what it can look like as a place. Um, I'm really keen to see this one constructed and go and talk to the people who are going to be living there. So moving on to section C, uh, this you know, blue green infrastructure, this is definitely a very current topic for many developers. It's all about working with the landscape and ecology there. You've all got the section, well, all of us, including the council, have got the section six ecological duties, which is about the ecological enhancement. So it's not just mitigation, it's actually doing something above and beyond and understanding why you're doing that. So all places need to do that. And it's the integration of SUDS, and that's 
creating a few kind of um, interesting challenges, but we're really keen to work constructively with you, with the development industry, with drainage engineers and our SAB colleagues in Swansea to make sure that works. And we've got some interesting, um, interesting learning we can share to make sure that you know, street drainage features are compatible with street trees, which is something that we're very for focusing on in Swansea. Um, and to make sure the trees don't have to be removed when the filter mediums in these areas have to be changed. So there's, if some of you want to get in contact on that, that's all I'll say for now. But there's, you can't plant trees in 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 swales necessarily in the bases, and you can't plant trees in bioretention areas because they have to be removed. But you can't, you you can plant them alongside into the carriageways is the key the key point there, and create localized narrowings. And it's all about right tree in the right place. If any of you watched in on the Garden Village Planning Committee report. Um, discussion a few weeks ago. Councillors were very supportive of extensive street trees, but they didn't want them to become problems. So it's getting sufficient spacing, right tree, right place, so they can mature without causing issues for residents. So this again brings that sort of um, that topic to life, which is the um, Garden Village strategic site, which is this area here is the um, biodiversity park, which is an area of ex existing retained vegetation and existing retained stream running down through the site. Um, it's a low point on the site, so there's some drainage attenuation, which has been deliberately deepened to permanently hold water for, 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 for great biodiversity value. There's lots of informal routes for the the residents and the wider community to use this space. There's no formal play provision um, that there's that's elsewhere on site um, and it's well overlooked by homes. So it creates a new kind of focal point and it's all about you know, in these developments so people can live with nature. So it's not it's, it's not exclusively one or the other. It's all bringing everything together and um, making sure that places are multifunctional. So next section is making connections. This isn't specifically about streets. This is about joining things up, joining the dots, maximizing the linkages. We all know the importance of active travel. So out, you know, we've got to question the, the, the relevance of cul-de-sacs. Some sites may be so small, and that's possibly the second presentation that we're going to come on to for infill, that they have to be cul-de-sacs. There's one in, there's one access in and it's a landlocked site otherwise. But generally the expectation is connected networks, no cul-de-sacs. If there are cul-de-sacs for vehicles, they can be connected for um, people uh, walking and cycling as long as they're, they're, those links are well overlooked. And the more connected places are, the more we're going to get that encouragement for walking, cycling for short trips and just the general um, recreation and activity um, so people can get out into their neighbourhood, um, meet people, the whole community cohesiveness and that. So, And just to say the whole connected network is also a fundamental requirement in planning policy well, so it's not a Swansea specific thing. We should all be uh, very, very aware that that's what's required. Two more examples, or one, exa two, two examples from one place garden village strategic site connected network of streets and links on the um, left image there so full perimeter walkway around the whole site lots of streets linking up which also gives resilience if there's ever a you know refuse truck collecting you can get an alternative way around through the site or a street has to be dug up and we don't want to sort of um, have people blocked in and an image of a, a detailed image on part of the site which is over here this detail image it's Connectivity for ecology as well, so a retained hedge becomes an ecological green corridor, which also becomes an active travel route, which is also frontages and outlook for new homes. So that's all about linking things up, that section of the guide, and no major changes from 2014, just a bit of updating with imagery. Public spaces, this is definitely something we've all become more focused on. Um, during COVID about the importance of our local neighbourhoods, our local green spaces and how intensively they've been used um, and making sure our new places have got sufficient provision. Starting point is fields in trust standards, which you know does require a lot of open space and typically um, could be negotiated down, but that's where we have to start. And that's what the and also as part of that is looking at what open space is in the immediate vicinity, offsite perhaps accessible. Um, and that's where you could request um, to, to kind of engage with the LPA on our open space audits. So that's not necessarily just within the ward of your site. It's a proper walking route analysis within the appropriate accessible distances because some of your sites may you know, sit between two wards or sit on the boundary of one ward. So it's important to look what's around the site. It's important to make sure there's sufficient open space and to recognise open space on site isn't just for the new community. It could be for the existing community to enjoy and bring 
bring everyone together. Um, we all know the importance of play for all ages, all abilities. That's definitely something you'll, you'll, you'll know that we talk about on all the negotiations we have with you. Local food production, allotments, orchards, those sorts of things, they're definitely things that we're becoming more interested in. And we know that our councillors are very interested in um, when you've got open spaces, how they're adopted or how they're managed. And generally, obviously, the expectation is the council will adopt these spaces with appropriate commuted sums. Um, so that's something to be very aware of. And here's another example from the Garden Village site. Fantastic park called Orchard Park. You can tell what sort of trees there are there then. And this sits between the um, existing community to the south and the new community to the north. This has pretty much got everything a park should have. It's got play for younger years, play for older years, all the kind of play provision in these zones here. It's got a Mooga integrated into land form. It's got a BMX biking track using the slopes, extensive planting, retained hedges, loads of links and routes through and good overlooking for natural surveillance. And these are the sorts of parks that are going to be the heart of our new developments. Obviously, this is on a large scale strategic site, but every site should be expected to have a decent bit of open space like this. Um, and it just yeah, it just gives people those chance to live those happy, healthy lifestyles. Streets as places, this is getting down to street design. And those of you who were on the call earlier this week for the um, developers forum, well notice that we'll know that there is working close working with highway colleagues on a streets adoption design guide um, and this section of the of the um, spg has been subject to input and support from highway colleagues so the streets as places section is supported by highways it brings the national requirement for active and social places i.e streets down from ppw that's in ppw at the moment um, and that's what planning authorities across the whole of Wales should be seeking to achieve that you know, streets are safe, accessible places, not just for vehicles. Um, it's about hierarchy of streets, so not every street is the same and the importance of pl planting comes into that. We are still working through what that means for adoption. Um, for example, there will be an acceptable, I don't know how many acceptable, but there will be an acceptable alternative for adoption to tarmac. So it doesn't have to be blacktop everywhere. But the reality is, is that blacktop is a maintainable surface and anything that diverts from that may require additional commuted sums to keep it looking good for the future. Obviously, we don't want block paving to go down and become a problem. So a few examples here, um, Garden Village Strategic Site. On the right hand side is a more strategic spine street. We've got a street hierarchy in the SPG that's tree lined streets give you a sense of these are the important links. These must be things that go somewhere or lead somewhere. And then on the left hand side are the much lower tertiary status streets, Muse streets, which is a green street. And we generally try and avoid frontage parking on both sides in the SPG, as you will know. Um, but we were convinced on this project that it could work on the basis that the frontages would be softened by extensive green infrastructure, much of which is in the public realm, i.e protected by the council, so won't be at risk of future residents removing it. And um, that was achieved not by reducing the parking standard necessarily, but by displacing some of the parking. So whilst rather than every frontage having two parking spaces, some of the units have got overspill parking, so they're not allocated. They're just off the top of the screen up here. Um, so that's how you get sufficient parking without having kind of a dominant in the street seam. So very interesting to see this built out and certainly learn from this one here. What you will know is both of these examples in the same project, they were pre-suds. So that's the extra level of um, challenge is to is to soften the street scenes and integrate suds. So that that's something we're working on various projects with developers on. Um, inclusivity obviously goes without saying fundamental, both in terms of part of building regs to access to buildings. If you've got mixed use developments, um, they need to meet the various accessibility requirements, but also the gradients within the public realm, streets and parks and ramps and those sorts of things and where there may be steps. So that's definitely something that, that it has always been a focus and, and certainly will continue to be so. Moving on to townscape, I think this was called buildings in the 2014 version of the guides so we've retitled it and it's one of the key points to emphasize here is we've introduced a new requirement for key frontages which some of you will know from negotiations especially on the larger site larger sites we are asking where are the key frontages um, and how are they uplifted so key frontages are typically well, the park example orchard park park example i gave you earlier 
a, a frontage onto a main area of open space. So it's a backdrop. It's an important frontage providing natural overlooking. It might also be a main street where you've got more people coming and going, importance of legibility, larger buildings or an important junction within the site. So identification of key frontages and uplifts. And one of the new criteria that you'll need to check in the guide in that townscape section H is on sites of 50 or more homes. There's now a requirement in the SPG for key frontages to be uplifted. So that's not in the current 2014 version. It is in the current version that's so out for consultation because we know that sites you know, do not work well when you've got a uniform approach to housing and you, you, you know, the importance of uplifting has come clear from from negotiations of over the last few years. A lot of this learning is from the strategic sites. Um, so for the many hundreds and we're starting to bring this down to the smaller sites because it's important at all scales. The rest of this section of the document continues with the emphasis on corners, views and street scenes in the previous version. The importance of street scenes is shown on the top two images here on this one. Um, it is impossible to get a real understanding of a place from a pack of house type drawings. They obviously those house type drawings are important to build the houses and understand where the windows in the back are and that sort of thing. But ultimately we need those house type drawings to be just the frontages combined into street scenes and see how it all fits together, how it hangs together as a place and see how it also works with levels because what might work on a level site doesn't work when you've got a slope. So we are increasingly requiring these street scenes and it might be that certain things need to be moved around. A certain house type doesn't work well to a next one, or maybe there's a group of house types needed, you know, the sort of for uniformity. So street scenes, fundamentally important, and we will be increasingly pushing for these. Image at the bottom there is a classic example of corner buildings. It's in the old version of the guide. We're going to keep it because it's so relevant and so good. Both of those are strong corner buildings. They're just different architecturally. So they both have got habitable room windows on two elevations. Um, but they just look different. So that's the difference between placemaking principles and architecture. So moving on, um, quality and character. So this has been moved up in the order of the document. Two key changes to highlight in this section that you would definitely want to look at probably is sections I.9 and I.10. Um, I.9 sets the requirement for where, as I mentioned before, where you've got a site of 50 plus homes, um, there, there needs to be uplifted elevations and we have set a percentage target of 20%. So 20% of your homes, if you've got 50 or more, will need to be uplifted. So that is set out in the new SPG. We don't define exactly how they should be uplifted. There's suggestions of how they could be uplifted through use of you know, different architectural details, through use of boundaries, so it's a whole place approach. So it's very much open for discussion, but there's a definite requirement there to do something. And where you've got the larger sites still, the sites that require the master planning, the 100 plus homes, there is also an additional requirement on top of the uplifts requiring character areas. So there's distinct zones within the site with a different character. It might be a variation between contemporary or traditional, or it might be nuances of use of different materials. So you know you're in a certain part of the site. Again, we don't say what the character area should be, just that the site should be broken up. So I'm sure you're definitely going to want to look at the those sections um, and the rest of that section document pretty much stay the same. And then lots of yeah, all these you know, examples here on the slide are distinctive places, different, different characters and very all got strong um, townscape and um, place making principles, strong frontages. Uh, and it pretty much goes back to that, that, that sort of the understanding of just to mention two older projects. You've got New Hall in Harlow, you've got Poundbury down in Dorset. They both are pretty much the same place making principles of walkable places, strong frontages, but they're very different architecturally. And that's the distinction we're just trying to get across in this section. Community safety largely stays um, as per the um, 2014 document. Um, it's not about fortifying developments um, and it's not about gated developments. It's very much about the natural surveillance, the communities um, kind of making itself safe. So doors and windows facing streets. It's important on larger um, sort of mixed use developments or city centre developments that or their conversions, especially um, that the entrances are legible and safe. We do see a number of projects where the entrances just aren't in the right locations. Um, residential entrances need to be in the frontages, not around the back is one of the key messages we have to keep giving people. Privacy and amenity. So almost through these slides. Um, 
in the current 2014 guide, there is a requirement for balconies or Juliet balconies for flats. We are increasingly emphasizing that point, especially since COVID, which there's been various studies and various reports um, about the importance of that private amenity space, or if there's no physical balcony, the ability to throw open those doors and get air and lights into your home. We certainly don't want anyone to feel trapped in these new places. Um, so we will, be, we will be pushing that a lot harder. Um, there's this continued use of the three O's overlooking, overshadowing and overbearing assessments and the standard um, separation distances that you'll all be familiar with. The key thing to flag in this section is the updated minimum space standards. So you will know in the current 2014 version, there are space standards already in there, which were based on the DQR standards of the time. Um, which you may have had officers flagging those space standards in using assess assessing your proposals. We are proposing to update those space standards to bring in the nationally described space standards, standards the NDSS, which is um, UK government um, because there's nothing equivalent at the moment in Wales. We do know there's the, there's the, the recent consultation on, be on beautiful homes and spaces that suggested a Wales wide space standard for all 10 years of development, so housing association right through to private, but that hasn't yet been confirmed. So in the meantime, we're proposing to update the Swansea um, Residential Design Guidance, SPG, with these N NDSS standards. So I'm sure you're going to want to look at that in the privacy and amenity section of the document. Accommodating parking, which is the last section, it's all about not letting, not letting parking dominate. We're increasingly encouraging the image there at the bottom, on-street parking for these developments. So kind of a return to what works in Victorian streets, but with integrated green infrastructure and with SUDs. So obviously they can't be allocated to individual homes, but the idea of on-street parking is a great way to make more efficient use of spaces, higher densities and potentially more cohesive communities. What we certainly don't want is projects that almost duck the issue of parking, um, reduce the number of spaces, and then on a Saturday or weekend end up with indiscriminate pavement parking. So that is a problem for all of us. And what we are also seeking to do on some projects, and it's in the SPG, is test layouts with tracking analysis to make sure that where there is on-street parking, it's properly designed in, um, and almost using integrated green infrastructure to design out what could be problematic on-street parking areas. So there's a lot of that going on, and it's really getting down into that yeah, nitty gritty of testing driver behavior on every street, on every corner, because, you know, we know that the bin lorry has to get through, but we know these have to be active and social spaces for people to live their day-to-day -day lives. So that's the, this is the last slide for me. Um, I'm going to stop recording in a mo and just switch over to Christina. Um, but just to remind you all, obviously we're in the middle of this six-week consultation with stakeholders, both yourselves as development industries and with the kind of potential residents um, who will, who will live and grow up in these places. There's 20 or so of you on the call today. This webinar will be uploaded to the website for those who can't attend today um, and will be available you know, until the end of the consultation period, which is the 13th of August, uh, which we have extended by a couple of weeks. So, so you've still got basically a month to take your time reading through the document to go on holiday, think about it and come back and hopefully give us some really helpful comments. Um, and we are still on track for adoption, I'd probably say late autumn 2021 of this year. So, you know, if you've got schemes currently in pre-application, um, you will have the new SPG used to assess that. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen there.